An average professor in India is paid around $500 per month. Let's break this down. There are three ranks of professors in India. The lowest rank is the assistant professor with a minimum qualification of a master's degree and an average salary of $500 per month. The next one is the associate professor which needs an additional 8 years of teaching experience standing at $1100 per month. The highest rank is professor with 12 years of experience needed and an average pay of $1800 per month. Let's compare this with an average person in the workforce. To keep it simple, let's consider computer science. An entry-level software engineer in India makes around $700 per month. Now add 8 years of experience and the average bumps up to around $1800 per month. For 12 years, it's a whopping $2700 per month. If these figures seem low, do remember India has a low cost of living in most of the places. As you might have already noticed, these numbers are quite miserable. Give a person a 40% pay rise, health benefits, and stock options, any sane person would opt to join the workforce instead of teaching. Naturally, this leads to lower quality teachers since they most likely consist of people who could not get a better job. You might be thinking, well, that's the case with almost all teachers around the world. Well, that's true, but they have other benefits like large scale projects, bonuses, and research incentives, which are not found in most of the Indian universities. Recruitment of teachers is yet another issue. Research work is considered to be the benchmark for hiring teachers. Teaching is a skill which goes much beyond than the ordinary chalk and board we see every day. Teachers should be evaluated based on their creativity and passion for teaching. They should be evaluated based on how clearly they can explain a concept. Students should be a part of the recruitment by conducting student and peer reviews for the teacher being hired but it's sad to see none of these are ever implemented. The syllabus is another major concern. The subjects are just all over the place. Let's take a look at the syllabus of a computer science student. Take a moment and think of what subjects would you expect for a computer science student using your common sense. Okay, now let's see the syllabus. Uh, we have physics, chemistry, uh, even biology, Indian constitution, uh, effective communication, and oh, my favorite one is a sense of Indian traditional knowledge. In the name of updating the syllabus, the subjects are just shuffled between semesters and their names are changed. For example, from database management systems to database systems, but the content is the same old stuff for the past 10 to 20 years. In the age of technology, where a $3 billion company can go bankrupt in a year if it doesn't update itself, there's certainly a lot more to lose for the young minds trusting the university to keep them ready for the merciless world outside. Books containing several question and answers from previous question papers, also called guides, are very popular among students since that's usually enough to pass an exam, which encourages rote-based learning where memorizing and writing long paragraphs is more important than actually understanding the concepts. Many universities have such poor facilities that they don't even provide students with their own student emails. Therefore, these poor kids can't even avail the benefit many programs offer to students like the GitHub student pack where the student email is mandatory. So the question to ask is, can it get more worse? Imagine a university with outdated syllabus and unqualified teachers with little to no facilities. How would you deal with it? Cool, so you would bunk classes and study by yourself. Introducing the 75% attendance rule. Universities all over India have a strict rule of maintaining 75% attendance mandatory for writing exams. 
If you go even 1% lower than that, you either show a valid reason to the head of department and pay a hefty fine or risk not getting a hall ticket to write the exam. Many students get away by paying the fine, which begs the question. So we're paying the college for not going to the college, but also paying them for coming to college. Unless you're in a top university, do remember that universities are, in the end, just like any other commercial business. They do whatever they can to increase their profits, even if it isn't the best interest of students. I would sincerely advise students in general not to depend on universities and to practice self-study wherever possible. Let me know in the comment section if you would like a second part of this video where I further speak about the hardships faced by Indian students. Thanks for watching my video, this was almost pancaked.